Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice today on the show. Alan, who do we have? We've got Wendy Deer herself with the much anticipated book, Rainbow in the Dark. We've all been waiting for this autobiography for a long time, and I'm glad it's finally out. Wendy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, so here it is, Rainbow in the Dark. It was released July 27th via Permuted Press. Is that pronounced properly? Permuted Press. It was written by longtime friend and esteemed music writer, Mick Wall. Of course, Wendy, you participated in it as well. And of course, it was written by Ronnie James Dio himself. And I guess the first question is, and me and Alan were talking about this, how is it put together? I mean, oh yes, Ronnie wrote it, but then you had to sort of fix it up, right? Well, uh, okay, so... Ronnie wrote up to about uh, almost the end of Rainbow. Mm -hmm. And then when he was sick, he scribbled a lot of notes, uh, put some stuff on his computer. And um, I have been talking about putting the book out for many years after his passing, but it just wasn't the right time. And then Mick Wall, who was a journalist and a good friend of ours and known Ronnie for a long time, said, come on, Wendy, it's time to get it out. So I said, well, I really would like to continue it in Ronnie's own words. So what we did was we took all the scribbled notes that he had left, and then we went back into the archives and found uh, press clippings of things that Ronnie had said at that particular time. And we kind of put it all together that way. And then I came in with a few things that I remembered that were going on at that time as well. So that's how we completed the book. So, so Ronnie was writing kind of chronologically and not just anecdotes from his life and memories from all over the place. No, he wrote all the way through to almost the end of Rainbow. Wow. And then after that, when he got sick, that's when he started writing scribbling notes and things like that. Was there also a point where, like, sometimes it jumps ahead at the beginning, right? Was that Ronnie writing that or is it just from the interviews that were, you're integrating in there? Like... Did he have a roadmap set when you were building this book? Um, Ronnie wanted the book to start and end in 1986 in Madison Square Garden because he had intended to write another book because his, his life was so long that there was just too much to be in one book. So um, he decided that he would, uh, well, he, when he was in playing uh, Madison Square Garden, um, someone said to him, a journalist, so how did you get started in the business? And he said, I was going to give the usual old answer. And then I thought, well, how did I get started? And he figured that was the right time to start and end a book. So that's what, what, what his plan was. And what I found it fascinating is like, as fans of Ronnie, we remember Elf, we remember Rainbow and Black Sabbath, but we really don't hear much about Ronnie and the Red Caps and, and, Ronnie, and, we don't and, hear about and... Ronnie and the Prophets and the <laughs> Vegas Kings. And we really got to really understand that there's a whole other career of Ronnie prior to all this. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, yeah, also, you know, it was like Ronnie had, uh, um, when he was in bands, even before, you know, Elf or anything, he would drive down from Cortland, upstate New York, to New York City and pad the pavement, trying to get someone to listen to his demos and so on and so forth, and look at, up and see Madison Square Garden and say, one day my name will be up there in lights. And um, so that that's why that was such an important uh, thing for him to start and end the book there. You know, the, uh, just uh, reading it, like you said, for, because of the unfortunate circumstances, uh, how would you respond to some of the people that are saying, like uh, critics of saying, hey, uh, why is it continuing a first person when, when Ronnie kind of stopped at a certain point? Uh, I, th I thought it was a seamless transition. But I liked it too. People finding that a little di difficult, uh, that it wasn't uh, switched over to a, a kind of Mick Wall. And, and, and before you answer that, I'm going to say yeah. that I actually, if I didn't know Ronnie wasn't writing the book, completely i would have never you know i would have never known i thought he was writing all seamless. the it's seamless yeah well a lot of the 
things that were saying in there were Ronnie's own words because we took them from different interviews that he had done. So that way he had said those things. You know, obviously um, Mick is, a, is an amazing uh, journalist and, and, you know, and I remembered things that were going on. So we, that's the way we completed. But I wanted it to sound like it was in Ronnie's own words because that's how I wanted it to continue. I didn't want to have the usual, you know, where you interview different people that were in his life and so on and so forth. This is a different book. This is a book about getting to know Ronnie, the real Ronnie, and how he was and how much he struggled. He wasn't an overnight success. You know, he, he worked so hard to get where he was. And I think that was something that I wanted to get across. And then you met, of course, you met Ronnie at the Rainbow, and you became a couple slowly over time. When, when Ronnie was in Rainbow, you talk about being lonely at home, you know, like the artist always away. Um, is that part of the reason why you wanted to get more involved with him as, as you know, as, as sort of his manager? Because, you know, you felt like he's on the road and you're at home and you felt no part of it. No, not really. Um, I never wanted to be the manager. He's the one who forced me into that. <laughs> very funny because I had come over from England, uprooted from England, uh, made my home in California. And then when Ronnie was in Rainbow, we, we had to move to Connecticut, um, which is a lovely place. But uh, we lived on a house that was a big house with, on five acres. I had no neighbors, I had no one, and he was on the road, and all I had were the dogs. So it was very, very kind of lonely. You know, I never wanted to manage money. I mean, he I always managed our business affairs and our finances and stuff because Ronnie wasn't good at that. But I never actually wanted to manage him. He was the one who forced me into that after his um, his last management episode. Okay. When, when, when it says in the book, you know, Dio, when the, the band came, he, did, he wanted to be called Dio. He wanted it to become a band. Uh, but at, at any point, did you ever see the other members as a simply sidemen and not, not, uh, not really a kind of a part of a band? No, I mean, they were the band, but they were paid employees. I mean, we paid for everything that was out on the road. We paid for the hotels, the, the crew, the buses, the trucks, the hotels, we actually mortgaged our house to, for us to be able to do that. So therefore, you know, they, they were a band, but they were still employees. They got and paid whether we had money or not. And, and Ronnie being the top draw, of course, with his experience in his previous band, so. Well, absolutely. He had paid his dues, that's for sure. Well, Wendy, was it the first time that you saw Ronnie? I, I'm not sure it was a little vague in the book at the Montreal Forum. We're in Montreal. Was that the first time you saw Ronnie with Rainbow play live? Or is that the first show that they did? No, I probably won't. Um, I don't think so because I met Ronnie. They had just finished recording the album. Um, and But they hadn't been on tour yet. He went on tour for about two weeks. Uh, and then he called me and asked me to come and join him for a couple of weeks, which I did, but I never went back. So. I don't think I was at that show. If it was the first show, no. And then, then sort of everything started crumbling with Rainbow. Well, I wouldn't say crumbling, but there was a lack of success in the U.S. market. I, I always thought that they were a bigger band than. But I mean, did Ronnie think that guys were doing well here? Why, why, why did Richie want to change direction, become more mainstream, and what was Ronnie's thinking at the time? Well, a lot of that was the record label. Uh, talking to Richie and saying, you know, we need to make you more commercial, you need to get a hit, you need to be that. And uh, Richie wanted Ronnie to start writing more commercial songs, more love songs, and Ronnie was just stuck to his guns. That's not what he wanted to do. He was very unhappy. And um, in the end, uh, they they basically parted ways. He got fired, really. Oh, wow. Okay. Go ahead, Alan. Just, uh, you know, like you said, uh, reading all these old magazines here. Here, this is from 84. You know, even Ronnie says himself, egoed out, pompous, you name it, and I've been called it. But it's all a bun wrap. What's the biggest misconception about Ronnie in your in your estimation? Well, I know Vivian Campbell who was saying he's cheap. Ronnie was never cheap with anyone or anything, ever, ever, ever. So I don't know how many people believe those things, but... Um, you know, and that's why I normally don't do those things, but I wanted to put in the book about exactly how much was earned because of the fact that I am sick to death of hearing that Ronnie was cheap and paid him $100 a week. 
how do you buy a Ferrari on $100 a week? How does Vinnie uh, Vinny Apache buy a house and Jimmy Bay buy a house if they only got home, paid $100 a week? And that's something that Ronnie can't defend himself. And I got really angry about that because a lot of people say, oh, Ronnie's cheap. Well, Ronnie never, ever cheap. He didn't care about money. He was never cheap. Strange enough, Wendy, I'll tell you, in the book, it says I, uh, Vinny, Vivian Campbell, and, and again, you're addressing this, you know, we did an interview with Vivian and he said he got paid less than the road crew. And I think actually that was the quote from the press that he said, but he said that in many interviews, not in one, right? I'll explain that. All right. So yeah. they were a retainer, which means they got paid every week, whether they worked or not. We maybe do a six week tour and the sound, uh, the sound man probably got 2000 a week and he was getting 1700. So then, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, what's the bis- biggest, and I'm, I'm on your side here, what's the yeah. biggest misconception, I guess, or, or about management? Like, the, everybody thinks that management and, the, you know, the, the, the deal camp, you know, they don't realize, they don't understand there's mortgages, there's, there's, there's stress, there's money problems, you got to pay everybody, you got to pay the road crew overtime, whatever the case may be. What is the Dragons. miss... <laughs> dragons is that the right word misconception or of, of management that artists fail to see well i think they fail to see how much work you actually do you know and especially when i was managing the band it was only really sharon uh osborne and myself were the only two women managers we had all these men barking up our seats that telling us you know we that, that we didn't know what we were doing and so they could do a much better job than us which i think women make very good managers a lot of women managers now and they take because they are they they're detailed they they go to detail they do things whereas a man might just say oh plus you know we we, we work really really hard and uh, i think the misconception is they think that you just manage to take the money and that's it but you don't there's so many things especially with me i did um i did business management as well as regular management you know, I mean, I, I was the one who would call the, co- the bus company, the truck company, um, the, the crew, uh, the hotels. Everything was run by my office. Every single thing was done from the office. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I think they fail to see the money aspect of juggling the money and just trying to get to the gig. So many expenses in a tour. So many expenses. It's like, uh, as I said, you know, you've got your buses, your trucks. You've got all those crew to pay. You've got all the crew you've got. You've got the per diems. You've got the hotels. I mean, it's like never ending, never ending money being taken out now, now. I defend the management. I defend the management. Go ahead, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, look, I get it. You know, you know, you know I'm, we, what we, we're, I'm 50 something years old. You know, I could see expenses and bills and the stress of trying to pay bills and it's not easy it's not easy Absolutely. especially when we started the band because we didn't know what was going to happen with Dio band at all you know and and we we just mortgaged our house and went all the way for it and did everything and and you know luckily it was success but it could not it could have been a disaster yeah yeah, yeah. Alan? Well, what, one of the revelations for myself was that that Dio already had uh, Ronnie already had like a solo contract set up while he was in Black Sabbath so uh, it was a lot easier for him to tra- transition into his own uh, his own band. That was a, for me. That was a bit of a revelation. That was never something that he was planning to do. It was just something that was offered, and we took it with very little money. Um, it was something he was going to do down the road. He never wanted to leave Black Sabbath, but what happened was it just became as as it does. You know, it's like a family. You get into arguments and different things go on, and it was just time for him to leave. Can you tell me a little about Craig Gruber, who was a friend, Craig Gruber, who was a friend of uh, Ronnie's, you know, he came in the Black Sabbath, he, you know, I guess he was in Rainbow, oh, was he in Rainbow for, first? Uh, yeah, yeah, the first? He was in Rainbow, the first album, and then when oh, Ronnie needed... So he, he wasn't actually in the band, he came in uh, to do some stuff in between, I think it was in between when, when Jimmy was fired and, and before uh, Bob Daisy came in, he was, uh, he was kind of auditioned and then Richie for some reason decided it wasn't right. What, what, what did, and you know, we were reading a bio of Craig Gruber and you know, he mentions Alan, what did it say? Something like he was in Black Sabbath for a short, you know, for a short oh, that, while. That he, he might have even played on Heaven and Hell. And it, I think he came in when because uh he also was having some family problems and he was out of it for a while. And so uh I think Craig came down just to 
um, to sort of um, work with them. So they had someone to play bass and stuff, and then he was gone again. Oh. <laughs> Poor guy. <I> mean, <laughs> Poor guy, look, he's, getting, he's in and out all the time. So uh, close. I, 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 I was reading that he actually recorded Heaven and Hell, then they removed his bass parts and Geezer redid the bass. Yeah, I, think, I think that happened, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, even they even removed his bass. It was even got worse for him. <laughs> well, because, you know, Geezer was a, a integral part of Black Sabbath, you know, and he was gone because he had problems, very major family problems going on and didn't know when he was coming back. But then he sorted them out and came back. So that, that was, it was There's another a transition. It was never a permanent job. Yeah, there, yeah, there's another female manager, Gloria Butler, right? With Geezer. Oh, yeah, very good friend yeah. of mine. There you go. Yeah, actually, uh, went had dinner with her two nights ago. Oh, wow, that's great. So, we'll go ahead, Alan. Sorry, here's a just, just there's another book that I got of Ronnie's with the dragon skin cover and all the. Is there going to be another edition? I heard rumors of maybe another edition of this coming out, uh, the photograph a book. Edition coming out, the DO years of a Black Sabbath book by the same company, yes. Oh, okay. He's a American friend of ours, Gigi Brunelli, who's been a photographer around with us for a long, 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 long time. He's a great guy and uh, does a lot of charity stuff for us and everything. And then uh, he's, he's got the photo book, that Dio book, and now there's a Black Sabbath um, book coming out. I think I don't think it's out yet. It's, it's coming out, I think, in the fall. Wow. That's, uh, I'm looking forward to that for sure. Going back on questions, um, when, when Ronnie did Mob Rules, so a huge success on Heaven and Hell, then Mob Rules comes around. I guess we all kind of know the legend of, you know, how the whole breakup happened, right? They parted ways, but was the lyrics, I kind of like, as I was reading the book, was lyrics, you know, Geezer wanted to take over the lyrics. Was that another sort of stress point for Ronnie? You know, you know, he wanted to control the lyrics. Did they, did they sort of argue about that back then? Oh, I don't think so. There was a lot of drugs going on at that time. And, um, I think there were a lot of people getting paranoid about certain things and so on. I don't know. I don't think Gita wanted to write the lyrics. I think he always was. And Ronnie wasn't just a lyricist. He wrote songs, too. He wrote a lot of the songs. Uh, he wrote also music. So, I mean, um, he just, it was just a bad time. And everybody was like, as I said, a lot of drugs going on, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of paranoia going on, and it was just time for Ronnie to leave. He was unhappy. You, you know what I find also amazing? That you drove, Jakey Lee auditioned for Dio, but then you drove him <laughs> to, to Sharon Osbourne for, for an audition with Ozzy, I guess. Is that is that the story? Because, because uh, he was in a band called Rough Cut, which we have put together. Um, because Ronnie wanted to manage him, and I said, oh, well, wait, wait, this is a big step here. Let's see if we can practice on some other guys. So we had a few other bands, um, Rough Cut, Alcatraz, and some others. And um, Jackie Lee was in that band. And then Ronnie decided he wanted to um, steal Jake from me. So he uh, <laughs> had him in the band for like five minutes, same thing as like Craig Gruber, but it just didn't work out. And I felt really bad for him because what do we do? So I heard that Ozzy was taking auditions, so I drove him and took him over there, and he got the job. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Um, what about so the, John Sykes? I, I know you, that that was a name that was mentioned. Did that not work out either? Well, I guess um, it didn't work out, but I, I think John's a great player. He's an amazing player. He just wasn't the right player for one. Okay, Alan. No, no, that's it. I just uh, wanted to thank you. It was a, a great read. Uh, looking forward to the book, and I'm glad it's finally out. I recommend it to everybody. Um, just a question for you, just a few quick questions. Was Ronnie more the man on the Silver Mountain or Holy Diver? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, neither, I think. He was, he was a big, big person on stage and off stage. He was just a humble person that liked to watch sports on TV and where he's sweats <laughs> tell tell us did you see the first cut of the documentary any news on that yeah and, I, did, I did it was amazing they did a great job i cried my eyes out wow and, uh, wow oh from bmg and my publicist we were all crying it was very emotional and they did a very very good job on it 
Um, we, we moved a few things around, added a few things, but I think it's going to be um, really good. You just saw it like recently? I, I read that you're going to see it. Uh, really, actually, yeah. Last week they were in town from New York and uh, we were going over a lot of stuff. And yeah, it's done really well. And I'll tell you, Mick Wars is excellent in it. Him and Eddie Trunk are excellent. They're both kind of go back and forth as kind of the moderators in it. And it, it did an excellent, excellent job. Lena Ford does a great job. Rob Halper does an amazing job. Glenn Hughes. I mean, it, it's it's um, it's it's different to the book, totally different to the book. Um, but it's just so, so interesting and, and and so touching. I remember last time I asked you, and you know, you're using super eights, and there's a lot of archival footage that that is being integrated and going back to to his hometown and and yeah. and. and, and and the rock is in it, I guess, right? And yeah, and, rocks and, it, yeah. Mm-hmm. and, uh, and um, Dick Buttoff, uh, uh, who was in original Red Caps, is in it too. Uh, wow, was, wow, yeah. wow, cool. And what about, and I guess the last question would be, unless Alan has more, what about part two of the book or live albums? Are they like, you always have something going on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But obviously, if the book does well, which it is doing well, it's number 12 on the bestseller list right now, I have a non-fiction number 11 in the UK. It's coming out um, in Germany, I think, this week. It's coming out in Russia, Japan, Scandinavia, a whole bunch of different places it's coming out in. Um, so we're, we're happy with that. If, if it's wanted, there are, there's a lot more stuff to go on uh, for a part two, if it's wanted. Um, I'm also working on a Illustrated book of lyrics, which I've always wanted to do. Wow. We started years and years and years ago and then put it aside. Um, We've got the the Dioban touring next year in March. Uh, We've also got a lot of uh, re releases coming out. I'm in the uh, I'm in the vault with um, Wynn Davis, Ronnie's old engineer, um, looking through everything to see what unreleased material that's good enough to put out or to add as bonus tracks. So there's a lot going on, a lot going on. Obviously, hopefully we get my charity going back again with the Ride for Running and the Bolt for Running next year, which we haven't been able to do this year. But, you know, that's, that's always something going on. You really do a great yeah. job preserving the legacy. That's great. I keep Ronnie's music in his session alive. That's, that's it. All right, Let's, there we go. There you go. From the 1980s, <laughs> my original <laughs> jean jacket. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I, you know, and, and to close off, me and Alan read it, and it's just seamless. Again, if you wouldn't, if you didn't tell me Mick, Mick Walls wrote or rewrote stuff, you know, of his interviews, I would have thought Ronnie wrote the whole thing. Mm-hmm. It just. It, it to be. That's exactly how we wanted it to be. I was a little sad when it ended because it ended, right? You want you want to read more, right? Yeah, so I'm yeah, a, wait for I, the second one. That's it. You know, there's a lot more going on because you know, in the, the in the nineties when we go into the nineties now, everybody grunge came in and everyone lost their record deals. So now we had to go out and find independence. We had to go back and play small places and build a career back up again. You know, had yep. to. You know, all these things, we've got the Grammy, which was wonderful, and the terrible illness of Ronnie, and, and all those things. I mean, there's a lot more there. But, a lot more, a lot more. You know? you know what? There's tragedy and triumph in part two. That's why I would find it very interesting. You know, there's a lot of, you know, there's tragedy and then the triumph of, of you know, coming back with Heaven and Hell and touring yeah, exactly. with the guys. Oh, dehumanizer in the nineties. And dehumanizer, that's right. And I am so happy. That's the happiest thing ever is is that Ronnie got to complete that full circle with Black Sabbath, and nobody was on drugs anymore. Everybody loving each other. Everyone was playing so well. It was like amazing. We got like only the riff master. You got you know Geezer Butler, the best bass player going, and, and then we got the killer drummer of, 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 of Vinny, and it was just so amazing to see them play and. It was so great for me that he was back where he wanted to be. Well, you're they doing were, a great job. Yeah. We, right. we were just one last question. We were wondering just before the interview when Ronnie sings about the country girl, is that you? Jimmy was Jimmy was wondering if that was it you. is you, isn't it? It's you. <laughs> a little mystery. Was that you? That dog actually. 
<laughs> sorry, repeat that. Repeat that. Sorry. I think it was that dog, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great way to end it. What about mystery? Was that about you? No, he hated that song. <laughs> that, was, that was the beginning of the demise of him and uh, Vivian because it wasn't all just about money. It was about the difference in the, the writing and stuff because now Vivian Warren got more commercial, just like Richie wanted to do, and that's why the song Mystery was on there and Ronnie was like, no, I'm, this is not what I'm going to do. I'm, I, I didn't do it before and now this is my own bad. I am not going to do that. The musical differences was a big, uh, a big thing as well as the money with them. Is there any song out after Rainbow that was about you that nobody knows about? <laughs> I think a lot of people know. He wrote Rainbow Eyes about me because my eyes changed color to blue to green to hazel. Yeah, so that yeah, yeah. Was my all right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It Thanks was again. A pleasure. Pleasure seeing and we, you today, Wendy. We, we look forward to speaking to you again when the documentary comes out. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Couldn't do it without you guys. Thanks a lot. Thank Love you. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.